no set of my office. It's a, it's been rough the last three days. It's a challenge. It's been cool, but. Yeah, buddy. You there, my man? Can you hear me? You there, brother? Hello? There he is. What's up, dude? Man. First time using Zoom on my phone. I had to download the app. I usually use yeah. it on my computer. No, man. It's all good. So now I'm glad we can connect. I, I thought we were going to go over a few minutes, but we actually finished just in time. So it worked out. Um, so no, so it's an onboarding call. So this is where I get to get to know your business a little bit better, right? So we know where yep. we're going to go. So let me, uh, put this together real quick. Do you hear my kids screaming? Yeah. It's my son. I just my, said my, my mom just got here. So he's like, Oh, excited. I want to go ride my bike to be a kid, bro. Yeah, man. All right. So what's up, bro? How's today going for you? Uh, going pretty well. Um, Good. business is a little slow. We're still ramping up marketing. Uh, sure. Sure. got a couple projects going on. Uh, one of our contracts fell out the other day, so we had to put a project back on product back on the market. And uh, got a couple of rentals, got to fill two of our units, got one more unit to fill of our rentals. So, I mean, we're still making progress. I just like to see more volume, but we're doing good. Life is good. Good, man. Raised, good. raised another 45000 this morning. Got it. That a boy. Hey, something. Yeah, yeah. Th th things are good. I mean, uh, things are good. But, you know, when, you're, when you want to be the best, you expect better. So I just had that combo with Mike. I talked about excellence and being elite. They go together. They're not separate. And, you know, being consistent and having a quality standard is everything, right? And that's actually what we were talking about a little bit on his call uh, was about having that ability to – you can't lead, dude, if you don't have your own standard. You can't expect right. me to be 100% if you're not going to be 100%. And that's how it works. Right. Yep. So that's good, man. So let's get to it. So the onboarding call is, is for me to understand your business better, right? We're going to talk about some numbers, volume, things of that nature. We're going to talk about team members, what they do. And then we're going to talk about the challenges, and we're going to outline all that. And then over the next few weeks, we're going to attack that shit, right? We're going to make it better. That's the whole idea. So let's just start with financials for now. How many rehabs did you do last year? Not wholesale deals, rehabs. Well, we averaged uh, around 12 to 15. Okay. And last year, your average rehab, what did that cost? I mean, we're dancing around uh, probably 40000 Okay. All right. And of those averages... What was the average say, ARV on the majority of those? Say forty five thousand. Average ARV, um, call it one seventy five. Sure. Good. Now let's go back and let's think about those those uh, those rehabs. What were your top three challenges looking back at two thousand nineteen? Um, well, it's, it's basically finding quality, quality, reliable help. Okay. So quality subs. And then, um, I really dramatically changed my whole systems ever since I joined investor fuel. So ever since Good. that, we've been doing very well. Um, please. <laughs> we've been doing then you say hi? All right. My daughter wants to say hi. Hey, Hello. what's up, dude? How are you? Hi. Nice to meet you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. All right. I got to talk to you. It's Coach. 
Coach. Yeah, we're okay. living that life. Yeah, man, life is good. So, mm -hmm. anyways, uh, can you, what was the question again? I'm sorry. No worries. Top three challenges you had in 19. Yeah, so finding quality, reliable help, and then I was spread thin. So You spread uh, thin, okay. I didn't have an acquisition manager. I didn't have project managers. I was basically doing everything by myself. Okay. And so since then I've hired, we, we have three people on this physical boots on ground on my sales team. And then we have many, many uh, virtual assistants doing our marketing and cold calling and stuff okay. like that. So we'll get and to that, that part. And that's good. Okay. Give me, give me your third major challenge we having in 2019. We have subs. We have yourself being spread too thin, which is not enough manpower and, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I guess we could probably say quality control as far as, you know, my standard, what I expect. And then it'll go back to me not spending as much time on the job site as needed. So that's why I just, I'm actually going through your first video right now. I'm almost done with that first one. And you recommend two, two minimum site, site visits a week. But I totally agree. The more you're on that job site, the more successful it'll be. Of course. So I'm, I'm pushing for daily site checks, but it's hard to do because if you have, if you can, yes. If you're, outside, if you're outside your radius, like you said, which we have a couple projects right now, then you just have to time manage them correctly. But yeah, yeah, exactly. So one in three are your are key KPIs. Okay, so your your top six KPIs in construction. Just so you know, one is quality control, two is budgets, three is timeline, four is sub inventory. Five is change orders, and six is, is actually safety. Those are your six KPIs you want to monitor on a weekly, if not a daily or per project basis, because all that costs you time and it costs you money, right? And that's where every rehabber bleeds anyway, right? So you mentioned quality subs and obviously quality control, which are obviously two pieces of your KPIs. So that's pretty good that we're already attacking the KPI issues, one and three. Um, let's look at 2020 as a whole right now. Minus COVID, how many flips have we done this year? Man, we're, I mean, we're doing pretty well. Um, okay. We're on track to do what we normally do. So 12 so, to 15. I've, we're, we're already on, we've bought 22 already. Okay. All we uh, Well, some of those are make readies turned into rentals. So I don't know if... The, those are like a little, little hotel, little, little, little paint yeah. job. Yeah. I'm keeping them for myself for the portfolio. Okay. So I don't want to count those as still, we're throwing guys on there rehabbing them, but it's a little make ready. Nothing crazy. Sure. So let's say 12, 15. Yeah. We're still, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. And how many do you think you're going to do by the end of the year? Man, my goal is 50 transactions. And then I like to stay around 20 flips. Um, I like, so realistically, I'm going to say 15 is a good goal still. Another 15. I like it. Another 15 flips. By well, year. flips total for the year is what I'm, what I'm shooting for. I'm looking for 50 transactions. So that's wholesales okay. and rental. Okay. So I still want to put out products. I just don't want to be burning my guys. I like to keep a steady stream of guys busy. And that's why we did the construction company. So we can start taking outside, outside customers. But that's still not going to be like our main, main MO. It's going to be keeping our company first, keeping everybody on the umbrella. And then if, and when we want to pick and choose our customers, we will. Absolutely. All right. Now has your ARVs and the average size of your rehabs remained the same 40 and about 175? Yeah. I mean, obviously you'll have some over do like 250 ARV and stuff like yeah. that, but I think that you're average, you know, our, cause our average customer, our customer base is a first and second time home buyer. Okay. Typically your first time home buyer. So people are buying our products and they're, I mean, we, we do, we, we go above and beyond for a first time home buyer and a flip, you know, but you know, I stay away from, you know, the people who are looking for their forever home and moving, wanting something nicer and scaling up because it goes back to quality control times and budgets, you know, so I can't control that right now. So I stay in my lane and we stick to first and second time home buyers. Okay. So one of the things we're going to look at going forward, and I shared this in the investor field, but we're going to look at something like this for you guys. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So with this said, you're going to start being able to categorize because you have, I mean, your rehabs aren't significantly large, which are actually relatively easy to monitor. So we're going to start looking at identifying what kind of levels we can create for you. Level one being $1,000, $10,000. Level two being eleven to twenty, dollars and so forth and so forth, right? When you start looking at this, it's going to help you buy better, but it's also going to help you start looking at projects 
all the way in the front end. Your buyers will look at it much better because we actually talk to the buyers till we work with the buyers, uh, if you have them, or acquisition, uh, acquisition reps, whatever you have. Teach them a little bit about the basics and fundamentals of what to look at in construction. Therefore, they can ask better questions when probing and go deeper in the deal so that they buy better. Your rehabs have a higher probability of being smoother because you can't force your rehab. You know that. And the shit that's missed becomes a change order and shit that's missed is not on the scope of work and shit that misses is ultimately not part of your budget. Right? So the idea is to keep yourself in a ballpark at all times. So if you are a $45,000 guy primarily on average all the time, then guess what? That's level five all day long. So you're a level five rehab company. If your buyers and acquisition uh, reps in the front end understand that, right, that's going to help them understand that, you know what, if I'm going through this checklist, all right, and I'm going through and I'm asking my questions and I'm probing, even for you, you're probing, you're doing your thing and you realize that we're going into level three questions and complications and full guts on kitchens and baths. And all of a sudden we're going into, you know, we need trim packages and windows. All of a sudden we're going into level four because it's, it's the replace level. Also, now I've got to replace the water here. I've got to update. i got to replace the furnace. i got to do a new AC unit. I've got to do a new service panel upgrade. What have you, right? Because all those things lead to other issues. You don't just install a service panel and not touch electric. That's impossible. So you start looking at those things. And as you check, Mark, you're just realizing that it's taking you into higher levels of rehab, which is fine. It's helping you identify what we're taking down. However, as you start getting to level four, you got to start getting a little nervous. Right, because you start looking at, you know, if level one is one to ten, then ten to twenty, and twenty to thirty, thirty to forty, and then forty to fifty, you're in that level four, possibly would end up in a level five because why? Change orders are going to happen. And if you're already probing a property and it's already a level five, and probably you're going to have change orders that then take you into level six, are you profitable? I don't know. Probably not. Right. So this type of checklist will, to begin with, is going to help you and your team understand first and foremost, what are we looking at? And are we scrutinizing it to the best of our ability? This is a ballpark level. At least this way you could say it's a level three all day long, which means it's going to be between 20 and 30. You're comfortable and confident there. We just need to later on down the process, which we'll get to, break down what that 2030 is. Is it 24-5? Okay, great. What's that scope of work for 24-5? And what are we budgeting within that 24-5? Everything is sequential in steps of construction. So this is going to help you not only on the front end, it's going to help you actually as a construction company because you have to look at it the way a contractor will look at it. Um, I can't tell you how many times that I've been the contractor on jobs years ago where the investor bought wrong and he's bitching at me. And I'm like, I can't force it. Yeah. Dude. You bought yeah. wrong. This, this yeah. is what it takes to get the job done. You didn't yeah. analyze the deal. You just looked at the numbers and realized, yeah, the numbers look good on paper, but the reality wasn't the same. Right? Exactly. exactly. So this 100%. will help you on two fronts, in construction, and it'll help you on acquisition. And this will also help your team because for you, right, for you to be effective and for you to be profitable as a construction entity, as an investor, and now both, right, everything matters on the front end. And all team members that you have have to have some level of understanding fundamentals, not, not to the degree that you're going to learn it. But the basic knowledge of how do I achieve a good offer? How do I achieve a good rehab level? And then that translates well, because like I said, if you buy the house and you buy it, and it's marginal. You're like, shit, it's really a level five. I would not have taken that if I really took the time to look at that. Then you would know that I'm going to, because if you're that close to going over budget already, you already know construction is going to be hell. It's going to be complicated, right? And then when you're able to look at a budget up front, when you estimate correctly, take a deal down correctly, then you're able to take your time and you say, listen, you know, it's a low level four, it's a high level five, whatever. I can't go, I can't go 51,000. I can't hit 51,000. I'm not profitable there. Maybe it's 61. We'll figure that out later. But you find out your absolutely no, no number. And you're like, we can never surpass 60, right? We can go up to 59. I don't want to, but we could. And then you look at that and say, okay, when we bought the house, it was already 51,000. You know damn well you at least need a 10% contingency and you're probably going to use it. So if that's another 5k, you're already at 555, 56, you're pretty close to that threshold. You know, if you can consistently stay there and be profitable, great. But if you realize you're skating by the, 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 the hair on your chest, then maybe we stop looking at those level fives and stay at level four. Because the idea is not to go in over your head on construction. Your idea is to be profitable so that you can keep turning these projects. And right. the same way you would do it as a construction company for somebody else's portfolio. You want to help them look at those deals and say, for the budget you're playing with and the, and, the, and the returns that you're looking for as a company, 
I would advise that you don't ever do a level six or higher because even I don't go higher than level four personally because I know where my profit level is. And so not only will you be really, really good for you and your company, you're going to be really, really good for somebody else in their company. Did that make sense? Yeah. For so sure. that checklist I'm going to upload in Moxer so you can get a, you'll get that stuff. So anything we talk about, anything we train on, I will upload that to Moxer so you can always reference it. All of our training calls I upload to my, my YouTube. And then I'll send you the link there so you can always reference these calls anytime you need. And the reason why I do that is because Zoom films it differently. I can't upload it to any other platform but YouTube. It's odd. But I and do my, it. To my guys can, it'll, be, it'll be on YouTube, you said, so my guys will be able to see this whole call. 100%. And that's the whole idea. So as you and I train, and then as you and I and Dylan train, or you and I and somebody else train, those calls are always recorded and shared. So you'll always be able to reference those and look back on them. I, I believe that's extremely important to look back on things because you know how it is. We're going to talk about a lot of shit in a half hour to an hour. And you might remember five things of the 50 things we talked about. You know, so I want to make sure you have something to always reference. So you know what the KPIs are right now. We know what we're buying right now. We know what our goals are right now. All right. Those three challenges you had last year, minus the fact that you finally hired. Let's talk about the team now because the quality control we're going to create. And obviously, quality subs we're going to have to cultivate. We'll get to that, not this call. Tell me about your team now. So last year, you had Mr. Anthony Coffee spread thin like butter. Now what are we doing to make your life easy? Yeah, so I picked up Dylan last year. And Dylan, uh, Dylan he started – He was. I, I, I had an ad for an acquisition, so I was going to hire a sales guy. But how it turned out is um, I, was, I was burnt on both ends. And so mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, just to take care of him – he can handle, he can still handle sales and I can still train him on project management. So he just followed me around on everything, all the lead calls, all the sales, all the projects. And then I would, I, I basically, he coattailed me and I told him everything that I knew how to do it when I do it, what the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so when we walk a property, I'll have a checklist when we walk a property. So we, on, on the acquisition side, he says, Oh, it's, it's, it's lined out of roof, uh, exterior siding, landscaping, electrical, plumbing, demo, stuff like that. So you can go through each line item and this, so at the, your acquisition guy can be like, oh, the roof is bad, X, X dollars here, you know, plumbing, X dollars here. And so that gets us in our ballpark. Um, and so, yeah, so to answer your question, Dylan, Dylan came on board uh, to do project management. He's been doing that ever since. And then we just recently hired a couple more acquisition guys. And so Dylan is going to be heavily focused on project management, which is why I bought your systems is because mm -hmm. we're at that cusp yeah, right safe, now right. where we're hurting. I know I'm, I know we're good, but we're not great. And, you know, I've been doing this for six years and yeah, I have a couple of losses, but I mean, we, we, we win the majority of the time. So it's not like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's just mm -hmm. like, how can we be perfect? Mm -hmm. And um, so now Dylan, and we just got a storefront now for the office for all the project manager, the contractors, the sales guys, they can all go there now. Okay. Uh, so that's cool. That's, that's really cool about that. And then, so Dylan stays in the office. He's handling project management now. We're, that's our focus now. And then uh, system operations. And so the two sales guys are going out in sales calls. And so what's cool is Dylan still gets a piece of those commissions because he's essentially he's giving up his leads, but he's, he's here for the growth of the company. So, he's still getting two and a half percent of each uh, profit that they, that the sales guys bring in. And then we'll do this for a while until it goes, goes somewhere. Um, and that's basically all we have. Dylan's my main guy. He's the one who's handling everything right now. Um, he came in, he cleaned shop of all my old contractors, which I was fine with. You know, he said they were just bad character. They were, they were, they were cheating me and stealing from me. Mm -hmm. um, so I let him clean house, let him build his own shop, build his own guys. So far he's doing great. Um, I mean, but we, they're all young. We're still learning. Everyone's learning because I want to, I rather have, I rather build around the personality and the skill and not have somebody mm -hmm. already sideways off someone else and, right. and, and just fit into our culture. So right now we got a lot of, a lot of really cool things cooking. Um, he's a, he, he knows a lot of people, a lot of these young, good guys, and so they're working with us. They're, they're the hourly guys I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. And so they've been with us for about six months to a year, steadily working 40 plus hours a week for us. Um, so, but they're not on payroll or anything, but I mean, I, I don't know how you want to categorize them. No, I got it. I got it. They're still, I mean, 1099 or not, they're still part of the team. Yeah. 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 Right. Obviously so, they've got a role, so that's good. And then so, my wife, my wife is my operations manager. She handles all the marketing and, um, the sales and the, the virtual assistants. So what's your, what's your wife's name? 
Candice. Candice, okay. Also so Candace Candace. and the acquisition yeah. manager kind of work in tandem. Yeah, so, so so I just call her the operations manager, operations and marketing manager. She handles uh, everything on the backside, all the CRMs, um, you know. So she she wears a lot of hats as well. Gotcha. Okay. Does she is she good at what she do? Does she like what she's doing? Does she want uh, some of that a, removed? Well, yeah, she's a killer. But uh, the goal is to elevate and delegate, right? So. Um, eventually we want to be stepping out and still have a full, have our whole bit, have these, uh, these entities fully operational and automated and, uh, just pay, pay people accordingly, uh, to what the company's worth and what their value they're bringing to the marketplace. But eventually, yeah, we don't, we don't want to be, we want, we want what everybody has. We want that freedom. We want to take three weeks off for a vacation and not have to worry about anything that much. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. That's the goal is to elevate and delegate and, um, not get rid of the obligations and just control your obligations how you want to pick and choose what you want. Sure. Got it. All right, man. So that's, that's pretty much the whole team as a whole. We got Dylan, we got two sales reps. We got the wifey uh, who plays a uh, majority of roles. Uh, and you said you do have an acquisition manager. Well, we have two acquisition managers and then Dylan. Gotcha. And, okay. So AQ over here. Okay. Yeah. Matt and Bill. Those are the acquisition guys. And then we have, I don't know how many virtual assistants, like eight to 12 of those, of those biscuits, of those guys. So uh, they're always they're I mean, they're always turnover. So they're coming and going, coming and going. That's what Candace runs and operates. So. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So we understand where we're at right now, where we were last year, who the team is and where we're going is the next step. So I understand that we want to be a better, more effective construction company and not only to serve yourself, but to serve others. Correct. Yeah, because there's a short answer, yes. Just a, junk, a lot of junk contractors out here. So I figured the Faithful brand, which the company's Faithful, Faithful Home Buyers KC, Faithful Rentals. Um, so if we can keep that thing going, the Faithful brand, I don't see why not we can't bring value to other investors and other customers and exactly tell them what we're doing, tell them material. My, my idea of the bidding is we're going to tell them exactly what the material cost is, what the labor cost is going to be, and what our market cost is going to be. We're going to tell them what we're going to be making as a company. If they like it, great. If they don't, okay. But we're going to provide warranties and quality of work. And I'm all about transparency. I don't like, you know, people not knowing or people feeling like we're doing something shady or something because I like to go to bed. So I, I, don't, I don't mind sharing numbers. I got you. Okay, good, 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 good. So take me through the process right now. I want time frame. So team puts a property, you get, okay, you get a lead in. How long before you take that lead, before you follow up on that lead? Is it the same day, five minutes later? Okay, so yeah, we have a lot of different uh, venues going out. So a lead comes in, uh, in an ideal wor world, the VA is going to take that initial phone call. The VA is going to input all the data into our Podio CRM. The, D, the, the VA is going to try to find the initial motivation. Just take the initial notes. From that time, um, our, uh, our acquisition managers are going to get this. And uh, oh, also the VA is going to be scheduling the appointment. So we, if we can try to go out there that same day, great. But typically now it, it's, it's usually, you know, the next day or a couple days out, sometime later that week. Um, and then once we go out there, and because it's usually pending how the seller wants to set up the appointment, if she doesn't want people out there that day or, or whatever. So we just go with what the seller wants. We don't want we don't, we don't try to be pushy and say, Hey, we can be there in five minutes. You know what I mean? Yep. You just try so, to schedule as soon as possible, obviously. Yeah. As soon as possible, but it's typically a couple of days, sometime that week we go there, we walk the property and uh, we analyze who, it. Who walks it? AQ? The acquisition manager, yeah. Well, which is okay. both acquisition manager and project manager. So. Oh, they go together. Okay. Well, they don't. That's not ideally, but that's like I said that when Dylan, when I hired Dylan, he's just basically my right hand man, and I was doing everything. So he's basically learning how to do everything. And okay. so as as these departments grow, I know I'm going to have to cut some something off and just isolate. That's why I was um, your your construction coordinator. Mm -hmm. You know, stuck out to me. It's like you just have to have more positions because right now he's spread thin. He's doing two full time jobs. Yep. Um, that that one construction coordinator is going to change the dynamic on the flow. For just because I'm, I'm I'm writing down your flow here, that that CC is going to be a nice addition for you guys because that person is going to be able to take a lot of responsibilities off all of you and really focus on the administ 
administrative transactional piece of it and prepping of it, which is you'll see as we get there. That's exactly why I'm asking this because I'm writing out your map process as we're as you're sharing it. And I'm looking at who's doing what. That's why I said, oh, they both go at the same time, but I understand they both go at some point. I get it. Well, yeah. And so basically how we're doing it now and how the company's sort of forming into that position is the acquisition managers, they're going to have a basic idea of um, rehab. I mean, Mm -hmm. because we go to our flips, everyone's just co-telling everybody now. So they're just sort of, everybody's just absorbing, absorbing Mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And so we have weekly meetings every week. And like I said, we're a transparent company. So we're, everyone's open. There's no question, no questions or concerns that don't get addressed. Um, and then all we do, we address the gaps. And so there's a gap and we, Hey, we messed up on this or the roof or the HVAC or whatever happened here. Everyone's talking sure, about sure, it. Sure, everyone's sure. In the department. All right. So acquisition manager goes out there, makes a deal, right? Puts it, makes an offer. How long? Cause I'm trying to track days here as well. So let's just right. say to get to the point of actually walking it for the first time, let's just say it's five days. Fair enough. Yes, sir. Okay, so five. So this whole section is five days. Now he's there. He's making his offer. He's getting some intel, gathering data. You know, trying to piece together what that rehab might look like. In the event that your project manager Dylan is not with him during that initial walk, is your acquisitions manager tasked with coming up with that level of rehab to make an offer? Well, so here's what we do now. We have checks and balances. So he's still taking all the pictures he needs. He's taking video. And he's pushing that back out to Dylan. And if Dylan has any questions or concerns, he pushes it out to me. So there's, you can push it up the ladder to, to see, hey, I have, this is what I'm seeing right now. Can you check my work? Here's my checklist. Ah, gotcha. Cool. So yeah. there's a checklist that, that exists. Do that. So what's that? So there's a checklist that exists. And then obviously Dylan's kind of just providing that oversight and opinion. Yeah. And that checklist is like, it, it goes back to that, that uh, when you're initially walking the property, you'll say roof, exterior, paint. Sure. Uh, landscape, HVAC, plumbing, electrical. So he's going to say, Hey, I walked the property. This is what I'm seeing here. Um, this is the year built. This is, you know, how many bedrooms, bathrooms, this is a square footage. This is the, if I, if I was running numbers, this is what I'm coming up with. Can you just check my numbers? Here's the pictures. So that's what we're Perfect. doing. Perfect. Okay, good. So he takes pictures, videos, does his checklist, sends that up to Dylan. Dylan then reviews it, gives him some input. So is Dylan the one that actually is going to take that data and come up with a rehab budget? Yes. Dylan. Well, here's what, here's what we're doing, Roddy. We, we reverse engineer it. So when, before they go out to that property, I'm doing a desktop analysis on what the market value of a three bedroom, two bath ranch style is within sure. a half. Mile. So sure. I'm telling them, Hey, our pro I know what our product is. Our, I, our product, we can sell it for X cause this is what X is telling me. I sold this ABC sold here, here, here you know, 20 day whole time, whatever. So I'm saying, Hey, we can be here. I write it conservatively. So say it's like 175. I'll run numbers at 170, 168. Um, and then this is how I analyze my deals and underwrite my deals to, I mean, so people do the 70% rule, 70% rule applies to me when it's 175 or above, I'll do 70% minus repairs. Um, if it's 175 or low, I'm gonna go 65% minus repairs. And if it's a hundred or low, I'm gonna go 50% minus repairs. So just to make sure we're getting some type of meat on the bone. Uh, of course. Of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how I'm doing it. And so, yeah, so when they're, when they're going out there, they're saying, Hey, I, I can, I can offer you X minus repairs. And so they're going to go out there and they're going to uh, assess the repairs needed. And so like, Oh, Anthony says we can offer a hundred minus repairs. I'm thinking it needs 25 grand. So our offer can be 75 or lower, lower, the better, obviously. So 75 as much as we can go up to uh, pending, we can stick within that 25 or lower range. And so I always try to tell them to be conservative, write your deals a little higher. Say, if you think it needs uh, you know, a new kitchen or whatever, and you think, you know, you can get it done for 8,000, say 11,000, you know, just something like an example like that, you know, and then just totally good. Totally good. And I'm then, up. and then you're going to go, you're going to explain your rehab cost to your seller and be like, Hey, this is what I'm coming up with. And just like our, just like, giving an estimate to a customer. Uh, this is what, this is what the market is. This is what we have to do. We're a business. We have to make money. This is our profit margin. And this is what we can do for you. X, Y, Z. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. Give me the time frame on this then. So pics and videos are being done when the uh, acquisition manager makes the first visit from the time period that he sends it up to Dylan to Dylan, then getting him back information. Is it same day, same hour, same moment, a day later? No, we got some lag time there. So, uh, so yeah, pictures get sent up. 
Dylan will analyze it or I will analyze it. So that will be same day. Um, yeah, same day for that. But draft up the scope of work after say after I mean because what I, what I like to do after we get a closed contract, I want to draft up that scope of work immediately or as much as we can on paper, skew numbers, break it down, exterior, interior, bathroom, kitchen, whatever, uh, because it's fresh in your memory. Um, but so Dylan and I are having an issue there on really closing that gap because right when we get under paper, I want I want a scope. So how long do you think right now it's taking? A couple of days to get to get a scope of work on paper. Yeah. Yeah, I would say three to five days. It's almost a week. Okay. Yeah. Um, too- um, so let's go back. Let's go back a minute. We're getting close to finishing this this work process here. Picks and videos go to Dylan or you. You guys usually have about a day to get back a, a budget. He then the acquisition manager then takes that budget, makes an offer. Well, no, 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 no. The 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 scope of work isn't getting built until we bring back a contract. So, right, right, right. I'm not talking about scope. I'm talking about like the when you say you have a budget, a ballpark of where you think this is going to cost you, right? You then tell yeah. that back down to your acquisition manager so he can make the offer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's about a day. Um, after the offer is made, contract is submitted. Is the contract submitted once the offer is accepted same day, or is that like another day? Yeah, contract and offer. Um, the contract to buy the property would be submitted. Uh, we would push out an offer and it's up to the seller. We put a a 24 hour timeline on the contract. So typically a day with the contract signing. Um, but a lot of these leads, it takes months to follow up and months to close a contract. But typically once they sign contract, yeah, it'll take, it'll take three to five days to get a scope of work built. And that's my, that's one of my lag times I want to close the gap on. And again, it just falls back to him being spread too thin, too many tasks on a plate. So that also that. All right, so from the time period that the contract is submitted to the time period that it actually closes, what's that time period look like? Um, con- time period from the uh, contract is submitted. Like, to the- like the diligence period, is it 20 days or 30 days? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say about two weeks. Oh, that's not bad. So 14 days? Yeah. All right, 14 days to close. It's good. All right. And then once you close, you own the property. One, two, three, Madison Street belongs to Mr. Anthony Coffey. Congratulations. Another one on the books. When do we start construction? How many days from the closing to demo day one? Ideally, I mean, I was, when I was doing it, I was, I was working on it same day or next day. And I was really good at that. Uh, again, Dylan, we, just, we clean shop. We were trying to time manage correctly. So ideally, he's starting it. I mean, our one project, he, it was started, I think, two or three weeks after we closed. Uh, but typically, it's that same week we, cl- we buy it, we start on it. So I would say around five days after it, five days or sooner, we got guys working on it. Okay. So awesome. This, is, this was perfect. So I don't know if you see what I'm doing, but I've literally mapped out your entire process as is right now so that I can do some work on it. Hey, I want to change the close date numbers because by the time we get under contract, by the time it closes escrow and we buy it, that's, that is about four weeks. About 30 days. Know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say two weeks is pretty good, man. There's no doubt. Oh, but we, do, we can do it in two weeks if the title, title closes and then we have and we're, and we're liquid. But most of the time, yeah, four, yeah, four weeks. So I'm, All I'm, right. So, so your acquisition process naturally up until the sale is made is literally 30 days, which is common across the country. Not like anything else, it takes you months probably to make a deal happen. Some happen sooner, some happen longer. That, that's that's yeah. what it is. So that's good. That's what I want to see there. So what I'm looking for here, and this is why the onboarding call is so, so important with you guys, is to really gauge where we're at number-wise. So you've got, on average, 35 days um, from when you've had an accepted contract to start demo. It's about 35 days from your numbers. In that 35 days, what are you guys doing as a construction entity to start preparing for demo day one? Well, ideally, I like to have the scope of work built. Okay, get the contract- got scope of work. Yes, have the scope of work built, get the contractors out there, start getting bids. Um, that's basically the, the two biggest ones. Start getting, start getting bids, get as much bids as possible, measuring your stuff out, build your scope of work, get it as detailed as possible. Okay. So yeah. what that's called is production is your second lesson of the day. Production phase. The moment 
a contract is accepted. You have to operate as if you're going to close, even if something goes awry and you don't close on it. You always have to prepare. <coughs> There's four steps in construction production, right? Step one is the pre-walk. That's when you do a contractor walk. So I want you to write down step number one, pre-walk, and then if you do a couple of dashes underneath, you're going to do some lines. During that pre-walk, you need to come to the table, you or Dylan, obviously this is going to be taught to Dylan, but Dylan needs to come to the table with a preliminary scope of work. It doesn't have to be final. A preliminary scope of work. Second thing is he has to know three things. He has to know the only budget you're going to accept in construction. He needs to know the time frame that he's only going to accept for the project. And he needs to tell the contractor the start date. We don't wait for that shit. Because if yeah. you're waiting for me as your contractor, I'm going to tell you everything you don't want to hear. Well, the, one of my, you may like this, but one of my sayings I've been saying my whole six years, and I tell every contractor, I tell Dylan, I tell everybody, but it's my business does not operate around your business. You either get it, get in or fit in, or I got to find somebody else who can fill the slot. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the easiest way for him, and I'm going to teach him this along with you, uh, reverse engineering the GC fee is a great solution. Controlling all of the contract minus labor and rough materials. If you control all the finished materials, you will always come in under budget no matter what the budget is because you're controlling 40 to 50% of the budget every single time. If I'm your GC and you say, hey, bid this and your budget's 45,000, I come in at 39.5 and you're like, done, you lost, I won. Because you know damn well I'm going over budget on change orders. So you don't give me that advantage ever again. The idea for you is to say, how do I take a $45,000 budget and control 50% of that? And I'm going to teach you guys, not today, but I'm going to teach you guys how to reverse engineer the GC fee, the 50% rule. And in construction, you cut that budget in half immediately. And that's actually where you start your negotiations because you just want me to come in with my three-man crew because I suck anyway. And I'm not ever going to give you what you actually want me to do because I'm a C-level contractor. And that's why you're going to be the A-level contractor because you're hiring me out. That means you control the money, not me. I can't even control the money. I have no financial literacy. I have no working capital. I barely have vending housing accounts and I don't have any really credit cards I can use credit on, right? You do. And if you don't, you will, because you're the A now. So when you control the budget, Dylan already knows what the budget is, right? And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this real quick. We will have an entire session on this. So don't think like, oh shit, I got to write this down. Let's just use numbers for context. 45,000, write that down. Times 10%. Equals what? 450,000? No, 45, 45,000 times 10% is 4,500. 45,000? Yep. Times 10? Oh, not times 10%. I think it's times 10. That's oh, no, times 10%. Yeah, yeah, 10%. No, 4,500 yeah, yeah. bucks. So you're yeah, going to deduct, deduct $4,500 from 45. So it's actually what, because that's your contingency. That's your money. That shouldn't go to the contractor yet. So that, that 10, that 10 percent is the contingency. Mm -hmm. That's, that's in-house money. That's Anthony coffee money. That's the, what if shit goes awry money. And it probably still is never enough because it's rehabbing. Now your actual construction budget is $40,000. Okay. What you do is you divide that by two, 50%, right? All of a sudden now you come down to $20,000. Yep. Right. So $20,000. That's where we're going to start controlling this contract with future contractors because you're the GC. You're in control. You take care of markups and overhead. You don't let me have markups because all my markups are in the other 20K. That's where I'm making my money because technically a $45,000 job should take 45 days to 50 days, give or take, depending on permit and inspection time periods. So you already know how long the project's going to take because you're going to tell me that. I'm your contractor. You're like, I need this project done in. 50 days or less, is that going to be an issue? Versus how long is this project going to take you? You're telling me how long it's going to be. You're also going to tell me when we're going to start it, right? Because you know when you're closing on it. Does that make sense? So uh, You cut out, man. You want to say the last 30 seconds. No, Sorry. no worries. No worries. That happens. No worries. So I'm going to run you through why the pre-walk is the first step and why it's so important. Hey, I got we a just, question. Is that 20,000, so is that 20,000, that, that's just the labor or is Right. So let me go back to that. And again, don't worry like you got to master this now. We're going to go through this. <laughs> so 20,000 is 50% of the overall budget. Usually 30 to 50% is comprised of all construction is usually just labor. Right. And again, you're going to be hiring a three man crew, maybe a four man crew at best. And those three, four man crew are tasked with what they have to do up to 25, 30 different trades. 
right? Because in new construction, it takes 25, 30 trades to actually build a home. You can't afford that. You don't have the margins for that. So you're asking a garage band to do 20, up to 25 different trades depending on the scope of work. So you're going to do some painting and some drywall and some electrical and some plumbing and some flooring, right? They're not good at all that. They're just not. So if you understand your quality standard of what this is, what I was saying earlier, you're going to start seeing how this is all making sense. Like I see this shit all the time because I'm asking too much of guys who aren't qualified to give me a level work. So I have to create a C level standard that is acceptable to our company and also acceptable on the sale, right? That's all it is. I'm trying to match for match. So with that said, 50% uh, of the budget is usually going to be a good margin to start negotiating at for labor. What that looks like is that Dylan or yourself will be meeting me at the contract, right? We're at the house. We're doing a pre-walk. I've got a preliminary scope of work. We're going through the project. We're, you know, one of the things we're talking about are certain areas that you, maybe you have concerns on. Maybe it's tuck pointing. How far do we take it? Maybe it's uh, the plumbing and the foundation. How far do we go? That kind of thing. I, as the GC, am helping, or as the, as the sub, I'm helping you finalize your scope of work. That's how that's supposed to work, right? Come there with an open mind that Dylan or you are going to be there to negotiate and build a rapport. Pre-walk is so that you and I can figure out, we're going to be dating for two months. Do we want to date for two months? No, you're an asshole. I don't want to work with you then, right? That's the whole point of a pre-walk is you want me as your sub to give you and provide you some insight as to where we're going with this project. You don't want the guys like, yeah, yeah, I do this all the time. Oh, yeah, do, I did 12 this year. Oh, yeah, I rehab all day long. Great. I presume you did this while you're fucking here in the first place. What I want to know is if I knock that wall down, do I have to beam it? What I want to know is, is it a 10-inch land beam or is it a 12-inch land beam? What I want to know is how long will that take you and do you have the manpower? See where I'm going with that? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're establishing poor on walk one. And if I'm starting to engage you and I'm starting to give you ideas and I'm being honest and transparent, because I agree this whole thing's about transparency. And I'm like, listen, you know, your budget's probably going to be tight already as it is. If you knock this wall down, sure, it'll look nice, but then you got to pay, for, you know, 750 bucks for this beam. It's going to take me uh, two or three guys to put that beam up. We're probably going to lose half a day doing it. Make sure that that's what you want. We can do it, but make sure that's what you want. That's the kind of rapport you want with me. We, we're yeah. establishing some dialogue now. Now you're seeing how I think. Now you're thinking if I'm being considerate, if I'm being uh, empathetic, am I being honest, am I being deceitful, am I brushing you off? Because you'd want to make sure that this is a guy that you can actually negotiate with because this is the first negotiation that's about to go down. Because you're going to tell me what you're going to award me the contract for. I'm no longer bidding. You know why? Because why would you wait for me to bid it? It's going to take me a week to get you the number. You're not going to like my number. Then you're going to waste time trying to track me down to negotiate with me. I may negotiate two grand. You're still not going to be happy. And I'm going to hit you with changers anyway. We just fucked the whole thing up and wasted time. Happens on every single flip when an investor waits for a bid. So when the first thing we learn how to do is how to award contracts and control the budget. And in this case, you have to do that because you are operating as the contractor. So you have to do this. You're not going to find tremendous success if you don't control the finance. So is a lot of this starting to make sense? This shit's going to oh, yeah. get hot and heavy, brother. So we're at walk one, step one of, of production phase. We have, we're out there with the preliminary scope work. Let's presume we've walked the home. We've done our thing. All right. It comes down to the three, write this down. You need three verbal commitments from me, the contractor or the sub, to go to step two, which is contract period. You can't go to the contract without this data. So you're going to tell me when I'm starting. You're going to tell me how long the project's going to take, and you're going to tell me what you're going to award me the contract for. Okay? So before we get to the first two, let's, let's negotiate the, the budget again. 50% of the 40 is 20. 20 is going to be a good margin. If we know that it's a 45-day to 50-day project, give or take, right? How many weeks is that on average? 45 days to 50 days? Yeah, it's almost said? two months. It's almost a two-month project. So yeah. you just round it up to two months, right? Four, eight weeks. But you'd like it done in six. So you tell me, all right, hey, right, here's the deal. I need you to get this thing done in six weeks or less. Is that, is that going to be a problem? Versus how long is this project going to take you? Right? If you tell me six weeks, my brain starts computing. Can I do it in six weeks? Because I start thinking about the other jobs I might have going on too, which is what you want me to do. You want me to be considerate of you. You're my client as well, right? So as a contractor, I'm like, well, this guy's hiring me out. Uh, I, I got I got to punch this on one project a week from now. I've got this one I should be finishing. You know what? I, sh I, I should be able to do this in six weeks, but I'd like seven if that's all right. You're thinking already, well, I've got eight. Seven will work. Right? You already did the pre-work here. You're already preparing. You're already looking at risk. And we're going to get to that later, but not today. 
there's a lot that goes into preparing for construction. So you're like, all right, I'll accept seven weeks. You make a note of that. Great. Seven week project. Um, here's what I need you to start. Actually, I put this thing under contract last week um, and it was the 21st uh, and we close on September 21st. So I need to make sure that you can start that week, September 21st. Make, look at your phone. Make sure you can start that week. There's no, I, I have, there's no compromise on this, right? And he looks, he goes, yeah, I can do that because again, you made me think before I got punch list on this one. I got this one I'm closing out. I can definitely schedule you ahead of time. You're giving me damn near three and a half weeks to plan for you, right? But you're still telling me when I start. Right, so now you got verbal commitment one and two, time frame and start date. Right, now it comes down to coup de gras, the awarding of the contract. So let's go to that number again. We know that it's going to be about a seven week project, six week project. Right, let's just say six for numbers. Your average guys, right, you can write this down as well. Your average three man crew is about a $3,200 a week payroll. Here's why the lead guy is usually about 35 bucks an hour when it all comes down to it. The second guy is usually about 25 bucks an hour, and the third guy is about 20. If they work 40 hour weeks, as they should, it's about 3,200 bucks a week. Then you just take 3,200 and mu multiply it by your time frame, multiply it by six weeks, multiply it by seven weeks. And you realize that if you multiply it by six, that's like 19 and change. You're like, you know what? Actually, this is actually working out to my advantage because my 50% is taking it down. Did I lose you? Yeah, I got back on now. No worries. I'll go, I'll go back and do it. So you're going to realize that the $35 an hour guy, $25 an hour guy, and the $20 an hour guy, which is your three-man three man garage man, is about $3,200 a week. $3,200 times six weeks or $3,200 times seven weeks gives you $19,000, $21,000. All of a sudden, you're like, I'm at $20,000. I'm right in the middle. This is where I want to be. So all you do is very simple. You make sure that you make him an offer that covers his labor. And then you give him a bump, which is a GC fee. You say, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to award this contract to your company for $20,000. I'm also going to give you a 15% GC fee, right? And that's generous because you know he's making the hourly in that 20 and you're still willing to give him a bump so he still remains profitable. So you go, listen, I'm going to offer your company 20 grand so that you cover you and your guys. I'm going to give you as a company a 15% GC fee and I'm going to give you a 500 or 600 or $1,000 rough material allowance. All of a sudden, you're all in at 22.5, 23.5 of a $45,000 budget. You're damn near controlling 47% of that budget, right? And it's not gonna cost you 47% in finishes. Do you see where this goes and how powerful this becomes? Yeah. And now you practice this, you and Dylan, and, and we're gonna have a whole session on this. So again, don't rack your brain on this because I know you, you're like me, you're gonna call this asshole up and be like, bro, we gotta do this. I gotta tell you something, we're gonna do this tomorrow. I, I get it, I know, I know, you just, I get it. But, but, but I'd rather teach you guys together and then you guys go attack it and practice. But right. I know you're like me. I know you're thinking, I got to call this guy right now. I wonder where he's at. <laughs> but this is how you start to control rehabs and construction is you have to control the money, right? That's why money is power, right? The people that have the power yeah. and the money because they have a, a buttload of money somewhere. And that's power when you're waving yeah. money around. You have to control the money. And that's the first way you control the money. So step one on the pre-walk is those three verbal commitments. You award the contract, you have to get a financial agreement, you award the time frame, and you're awarding the start date. Now you can go to step two, which is the contract period in which you're putting your contracts together. And I'm not gonna go through that today, but we will. We're gonna decipher, we're gonna, we're gonna dig deep on all these processes when we have Dylan on the line. So step two is the uh, contract period where you're gonna get your contract, scopes of work, budget, schedule, everything ready for the contract to review and sign. Step three, when you receive that back, is called pre-con which is pre-construction meeting, all hands on deck meeting at the project. This is all prior to construction, right? You want to go back now. We've got the scope of work. We've got the budget agreed to. We've got the contracts. We've got the schedules. We're going to go meet that project one final time to make sure we, nobody as a team missed anything. And in construction, the very first changer usually happens before construction starts. It's usually at the pre-con meeting, somebody made a decision to change something. Maybe you decide you do want to knock the wall down. Maybe you change the tile. Maybe the contractor changed his time frame because he's got a project that got delayed for other reasons. The change orders usually happen before construction. Okay, just so you know. So don't think that that's not common if that ever happens. So that's where that conversation does happen, though. Maybe changes are going to be made in the previous two steps. Um, but that's your speak now, forever hold your peace meeting. We're, we're ready. We're set. We got contracts. At that site, at that job meeting, where's mine? At that job meeting. You're going to take all that contract documents that were signed. You're going to put it in a folder. 
and you're going to drop that on the job site. That's your job site binder. And you're going to, and you're still going to use our CRM system. So we're going to get to all that. Don't worry. But the idea here of running these jobs as a project manager is to be so efficient that you have time. The whole idea is to do double and triple work ahead of time during production. So you have time and freedom, right? So you're not doing this shit during construction. You've prepped it so that you can be proactive and predictive once project management starts, right? All the hell you go through in construction is because you didn't prepare for it. And then you're backtracking. And when you backtrack, you reacted, you're losing time and money. You're losing time and money. You're losing time and yeah. money. So we're going to make you extremely efficient on the front end so damn well that the only things that Dylan has to worry about is managing the subs. Get them on the job, quality work, doing site visits, being effective, get the shit done. And that's a whole other lesson as well. Don't worry. So you drop that job site binder at step three. You tell the subs, this stays on the job site. I don't want it in your car. I want it here. I'm the first to drop it off. I'm the last to pick it up. And it's got the scope of work in there. It's got the schedule that they filled out. And they're going to start going. And when we get into project management, you're going to see why this is so awesome. I'm not going to talk about that today. It's onboarding. And the final step is step four. And that's the money. That's the money review. That's when you and Dylan, mainly Dylan, are going to go back, look at all the contracts, look at the schedules, look at the draw process, look at the budget overall and make sure that they all are cohesive, that the draws that were going to be agreed to be offered uh, that is accounted for, and that the milestones and that the Gantt charts have been filled out. Yeah, you're probably thinking, we don't do Gantt charts, but you're going to, because Gantt charts is how you control draws. That's how you manage draws, right? You're thinking, I don't want to do that, but you're going to, right? That's how you become efficient. Those four steps have to happen in construction anywhere in the world, no matter what you're building. You don't go build roads without preparing for it. You don't go build a school without planning for it. You don't go build a home without planning for it. And right. in this case, you only have 30 days to do it. That's why I'm following the map here. That's why I ask the questions I'm asking. Because I'm trying to determine what is our window at Anthony Coffee's company. If we have 30 days, perfect. One step a week. Think of it that way. Right? We have four steps, four weeks if you want. I do all these steps in probably two weeks. It just, you just get good at it. Right? You just know what, what to do. And eventually this will become instinct. The idea of becoming an elite rehabbing company is because everything is instinctual. Because your continuity is always there. Your transparency is always there. And you don't deviate from your process. That's all this is, fundamentals. We put the process together and you guys follow it seamlessly until it becomes instinct. And when it becomes instinct, that's when Dylan will command the respect of the troops on the field. As a leader, when they see how, how, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. When he becomes, he, he's so consistent. Sorry, consistent. His consistency is really what's going to help them go. He's not going to let this fly. I already right. know what he's going to say. I know he's going to be here because he always says he's going to be here at 12. I know what he's going to say about this trim because he's consistently monitoring the job and like not that. deviating from his process. When you yeah. get the respect of the troops, you guys are both going to meet your objective. And it starts with you guys. The accountability starts with you as the owner and then Dylan as a project manager. And once you get a CC, that's the tribe right there. That's the tribe. I think you guys that's will be a operating. CC. What I'll do is I'll upload a job description that you can literally copy and paste and put in Indeed if you want. I'll upload that to Mastro so you can see what that looks like. I do that for all of our clients and then they can usually can, you know, you can reword it however you want to do, of course, make it market friendly to you, but send that out and see what you get. And it could be an hourly position to start. I'm telling you 18 bucks an hour, nothing crazy. And it could be a part-time job to start 20 hours a week, get them integrated, get them slowly going. I'll assist you with the hiring and the screening and I'll assist you with the onboarding of that individual. So don't worry about that, but that's the triangle dude. That's, 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 that's the squad right there. Will you and send me, you'll send me the roles and responsibilities of the CC as well. That's OP? Absolutely, bro. Yeah. Absolutely. So that just tells you right there, right? It was perfect. We did 50 minutes on it. It was perfect. I got the idea of how the process works, and then I got to share with you how production and why production is so important. And production also, we're going to go through this too, is the risk wheel. Every project should be analyzed for all the risks and challenges that are going to be coming because you want to be what? Predictive and proactive, not reactive. Because when you're reactive, it costs you money. So the more you prepare during those 30 days, right? And the better you get at that, the sooner you can get production done. Yeah. How nice is it to be like, hey, 
we're actually ready for construction on this project. Put it on the file. We just got to wait till we close. That's a phenomenal day. Yeah, that's great. Right? Not like, oh, shoot, we close on this. Do we have scopes to work? Or when the fuck, you know, are we ready? The contractors on the contracts, get them out. You don't want that life anymore. That life's not going to give you what your goal was to me. Freedom and time. Family. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You're hitting spot on, man. Good. Good. That's what onboarding is all about, bro. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like to train with you guys two times a week for the next four weeks. Get with Dylan in the meantime and tell me, uh, propose a couple time slots that we can keep the same dates. So if it's Tuesdays and Thursdays or Mondays and Tuesdays, whatever, give me dates that you can do consistently for four weeks, twice a week, and give me time frames you can do consistently so I can compare that with my schedule. And we'll figure out what works best for everybody. Lock those in and continue with the training. Are they hour? Are they hour trainings or how long? They're, they're usually hours. Sometimes they go over, but on average, they're an hour like this. And the way I teach and the way I speak, I mean, we talked about a lot of shit in fifty-two minutes. Yeah, I like your style, man. I appreciate it, bro. I mean, I'm not here to waste your time. I'm here to show you what you need to do so we can do it. That's say I'm just meat and potatoes. Give me the meat and potatoes. Let's get to the chase. To show me the gaps. Let's close those, those gaps. Like I said, if you tell me honestly where you're at and where you're going, I could plug in. Yeah, and I yeah, I will definitely keep you updated for sure. Um, but yeah, so far so good, man. This stuff is gold. I, I I do a lot of the stuff you're doing, but you're just doing it more at a precise, skilled execution. You know what I mean? So I, I time it. I have everything on a time. That's my mind. Is time. Time equals efficiency. Efficiency equals profit. You got to yeah. time these things. And when the CC gets involved. You're going to see how that cycle works, that department works, because there will be time on it, right? Like, and I'm going to go a little further in this combo. Let's just say, um, where are we at? Let's say property's under contract and production starts immediately, right? The CC at that moment has 10 things to do and Dylan's got 10 things to do. And they're in the same department doing a bunch of tasks that are going to get us around the circle to demo day one. It happens immediately. The trigger goes off. So it's like, here's, am I, am I losing you? No, no, no. Could the CC be a virtual assistant or do they have to be physically boots on ground? Virtual assistants, we've tried it. It won't work because they still need to be relatively involved damn near 40 hours a week. And a virtual assistant is not going to be involved 40 hours a week, especially if they're from fucking Thailand and the hours are different. You need somebody who's involved like now. Like if I said, if I'm your project manager, I'm like, dude, I need Anthony. I text you and right now I'm like, bro, I need this. I got to get yeah. it now, right? Yeah. yeah. So it Good doesn't point. really work with the virtual assistants because they, they usually, the timing is just not there. And this is going to be a timed event, you know, to get a scope yeah. of work. We're going to give Dylan 24 hours for the CC to do intake and get contracts out. We're giving them 24 hours. Everything operates on a timely manner. And you're going to start going back to EOS, right? You're going to start doing those pipeline meetings and level 10s on Fridays. You can start going back to all that because the system will require it. When you, have, when you have the addition of a new employee uh, or even a 1099 that you contract out for the CC, it depends on what you want to do budget-wise, what you can afford right now. But let's say you bring them on, they're an employee, great. You're going to have three people, including yourself, they are going to be heavily involved. Probably your wife as well are going to be part of those meetings to say, what's our old business? What's our new business? What are our challenges? What do we need? Let's go, break. And then you guys go off and do your job for the week. And on level 10, you all get together again and say, how'd the week go? What do we miss? Anything get not done? You know, what's lagging for next week's pipeline? Because the way construction intake works per project is I want you to think of a seven-day time frame that when you know you're getting ready to do construction, you want to take that, if, if pipeline was today, let's say today's Monday, and you have a new project that you just closed on, you closed on it Friday. So that clock is now ticking on those 30 days. So now it's yeah. just the trigger for the CC and the PM to get on production, Right administratively yep. the cc's got to get paperwork and contracts and all that shit together and get the vendors and the skew list and materials all together for that job pm's got to go out there walk the project get the scope of work done finalize the budget get the commitments to send that back to the cc so the cc can draft the contract get the job site binders prepared right and then that's a seven day process come next pipeline you say hey what happened with one two three it's ready for construction well, right, well here's the next ones here's the next ones here's the next one does that make sense Oh, it makes perfect sense, man. You're just spot on. And like I said, that CC, I just feels like it's that, it's that missing gap, that missing little. That could position. be your 25%, bro. Yeah. So that could do be you, that little thing. And you put them on payroll or do you just pay them hourly or how's that work? Do hourly and then give them an incentive. So if you're giving dude two and a half percent, 
look at your numbers and see if you can afford 5% and let them both try to get 2.5%. So that 2.5% would be like the gross profits or? It, it can profit. be. It, it, it depends on your margin. It could be gross profits. It could be of the construction budget. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, just it, it, we can look at that as we get there. But it, that just comes down to financially, how do these projects work for you, right? Do you, do you have money in the budget? You might, right? If you're going to start controlling 50% of the budget, you might have it in the budget for the construction budget. Well, so again, I lost you. I know. I get it. I'm so used to this now. So again, it comes down to your budget. If you're going to control 50% of the budget as a contractor, right, and as a company, then you might have that money uh, for them, for the CC to earn their keep as a bonus in the construction budget. And then you keep... Um, Dylan at two and a half percent gross profit. This way, none of them are really double dipping, but they're accountable to each other. You know, and maybe you cut those in half. Maybe you say, Dylan, look, dude, I need you to earn that two and a half percent, bro. I need you to earn that. And in the way they got to earn that is I'm going to make the CC earn their bonus. Like they got their base. They, they want to earn a bonus. That project's got to get done on time, right? That project's got to be done on time to our quality standard. All right. And you have to work together to get that. Sorry to interrupt you. Can this CC be a subcontractor as well for now until they know the systems or? A subcontractor that has previously worked for you? Well, just like, I mean, how, I guess, how you're paying them, I mean, you know, cutting a, a, a check each week for their time instead of them put, put them on payroll or, or whatever. Sure, you could 1099 them. Yeah. You could definitely 1099 them, um, however you want to do that. Um, you know, that's not going to be as attractive, I would imagine, to a quality CC, right? So you think, um, you think just stowing them right on payroll then? Well, if it's hourly, take a look at hourly. That's why I said if you start them off at like you know, $18 an hour, you know, something like that, nothing crazy, and you start them off at 20 hours a week, what does that look like for your payroll? You know, does that hurt your payroll or is it like comfortably okay? Because the idea is to get them kicked off into the program so that they can start helping you earn, right? They got to earn their keep. So get them up and running, get them working with the PM so that those two are individually together and as a team are working to get these things set up and knocked out, set up and knocked out. And the, the quicker that they're up and running in terms of understanding their SOP and role, then they become advantaged to you. Then they become worth it. Then you can figure out how you want to pay them on bonuses. Maybe you don't pay them bonuses yet. Let them earn that. So I'm looking for a part-time construction coordinator that can grow into a full-time position. To start, you'll be making hourly X amount. And once you go full time, there will be bonuses. So you give them the incentive to earn it. And by the time they go full time and are getting bonuses, it's because they've earned the right and they're making you money. And you said for the personality traits for the CC, you're looking for a high D and high C. Is that right? It usually is pretty well suited in that position because you want somebody who's assertive, aggressive, and somewhat of a leader because you want that person to be like, dude. I walk in Monday morning, I ask for invoices, I'll have invoices from the contractors, you're bitching at me that they want to have a draw on Friday, I don't have any invoices. You want somebody kind of like that saying, come on, Dylan, let's roll, bro. Right? I got yeah. your back, but you got to get my back too. You want yeah. somebody like that who doesn't have an issue, but you also want somebody of high intellect organizational skills, right? But you want somebody that's not too much of a leader. You, want, you don't want somebody that's trying to overtake the office, but you do want somebody that's going to have a higher level D but Dylan should have a higher D than the CC. Okay. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. This stuff is gold, man. Good. I'm glad, man. I'm glad. So do me a favor. Take a look at your schedule. Propose me some times. We'll make it work and we'll get to get cracking on this. Yeah. Let me give uh, Dylan a call and uh, can I text you? Don't, or? don't start telling him about the 50% <laughs> rule. Wait, dude. Cause you're going to, you're going to, Fuck him up, man. You are. He's going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, if anything, I'm going to tell him about, you know, the CC and what we got going, coming, sure. up, coming down the pipeline in the future, to, you know, to help him out a little bit. Yeah, but, dude. All right. All right. Yeah, you can But you know, yeah, the 50% up. rule, you still got to – I like your, I like that terminology and I like control and all that. So, yeah, I, I can't speak well enough on it, so I'm not even going to say anything. <laughs> Just tell him big shit's about to go down. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, I'm going to text – I'll call Dylan. I'll text you here in a little while and then it, see what times work. All right, man. Good onboarding call. Yeah, man. It was awesome. I appreciate it, Roddy. You got it, bro. I'll talk Have to you soon, dude.